This week's episode of This Is Only a Test is made possible by the fine folks at MailChimp. MailChimp is an easy-to-use marketing platform with a name that might make it sound like they only do email. But you know they do just about everything to help your businesses grow, like ads, postcards, landing pages, audience management tools, automations, reports, and more. You could say MailChimp grew so much that they outgrew their name. And their marketing tools can help you do the same. Go to MailChimp.com to sign up for free and see how MailChimp can grow your business. MailChimp. They do more than mail. Hey, let's start the program for Thursday, February 21st, 2019. Welcome to This Is Only a Test, the official podcast of Tested.com. is officially out on assignment so the inmates are ruling the penitentiary right now we can't say what he's doing but you'll be glad to see it i literally can't say what he's doing because i don't know what he's doing (laughs) so welcome in i'm kishore i am co-hosting this week with the one and only jeremy williams hi kishore we're doing a duo cast enough of this three people podcasting i don't think we've ever done this before the two of us yeah yeah, in the history of podcasts, there's never been a duo cast like this. I told you on Saturday, look, I have been hit by this cold like a freight train. I might not make it in. But here I am, day quilled up, caffeinated, ready to record what is undoubtedly to be one of the greatest podcasts ever laid to the internet. I feel like you minority reported me because later that evening, I started getting ill. <laughs> And so now I have some medicine in me yeah. and caffeinated up. So it'll definitely be the best podcast hey. ever. I'm just back from a week away. How'd you guys do without me? Who'd you replace me with? You were gone last week? Yeah. Uh, oh, thanks. Will, Will was here. Oh, the genie? You had the genie in. Yeah. Oh, he yeah. must not be thrilled he, with what's going on. He didn't blue himself oh. yes, last week, but he, he, was, he, he knew all about that. Yeah, I'm sure he did. <laughs> I'm sure he did. I was at Harry Potter Land, and I was expecting the worst. I was expecting crowds. Yeah. I was expecting an underwhelming butterbeer. I'm here to tell you. Florida or? or I went Anaheim. to L.A. I went to L.A. It was awesome. Was it? I dressed up as my as a Ravenclaw, because I am Ravenclaw. How do you dress up as a like is that the, with the? I bought formal dress robes and dressed up as a Ravenclaw. But is that like the specific badge? Like, is there a Ravenclaw yeah. emblem? Yes. Okay. There, there's a house. There's a whole way of being when it comes to being a Ravenclaw. It's just really the nerdy house, so it's right. not a long walk for me. Anyways, I enjoyed it. I thought butter beers tasted great. I thought the rides were good. That hippogriff thing way too short. I'm going to Florida now to go to Harry Potter Land there. Well, that's the older one. They opened up the one in Anaheim. It's not Anaheim. It's, it's in L- it's Hollywood. LA. Yeah. yeah, it's LA. Uh, they opened that one up uh, after our last visit, which had to have been within the past year. Uh, it's, it's a couple it's, years old. Is yeah. it? No, is it that new? Yeah. Wow. Our old? Yeah. It was amazing. Cool. I'm I'm ready Did, for a spring break adventure there. Can you buy a wand when you go? I bought an interactive wand. They yeah. have IR cameras set up that you can cast spells with like, certain flicks of your wrist, and it sometimes works. Where are these spells? What do you do that? Like There's a, a lot of like storefront windows that have IR cameras hidden. You mean and they, th- like throughout the, the Throughout the, the little land? area. Wow. And you have, um, they sell wands that have like an IR receiver on it and you can, um, you know, flick your uh, wand in a certain pattern and it creates like an animation inside of the There's storefront window. got to be Easter eggs where like certain movements, if you discover them, you'll cast a spell other children don't know about. I don't know. I didn't discover them, but there's like 10 spells that we cast. It was a lot of fun. I bought the, like, my wife is like, why are you buying an interactive wand? I'm like, because I'm a wizard. And then I ran off and (laughs) started casting spells. (laughs) I'm sure that was a huge surprise. Yeah, it was great. Uh, This is Oscar week. Are you excited about Oscars at all? No. I am in your category, too. I I watched a couple Oscar movies, and I'm just like, okay. 
I don't know. I, there was a moment. There was a moment in time when they were going to put a lot of the technical awards during the commercial break. And technical awards. It was like cinematography. No, these were major <laughs> yeah. awards. Technical, like yeah. Editing. Right. Yeah. They were like like major parts of the filmmaking process were going to be relegated to the commercial breaks. And then they changed course within what, like 48 hours, put them back on the air. Yeah, because everyone that is coming to the Oscars were like, this is a terrible decision. Yeah. <laughs> Don't do this. Uh, I mean, I'm, I'm glad they reversed course. I am too, because I, I really have most experience with those technical aspects and I appreciate that art. But I bet that the uh, the people who run the show probably know that most moviegoers just want to see the celebs. That's uh, that's fine. Yeah, but that doesn't mean you you sacrifice the integrity of what awards for movies are about, mm-hmm. and just relegate all of the other awards except best actor to to some other time. Anyways, I'm glad they fixed it. Um, I watched Roma. That's the only one I've seen that okay. I really recommend. And that's on Netflix, so it's easy to that's do. That's the only one of the, yeah, all the, the ones that for Best Picture? That I've seen that I okay. recommend. Yeah. I mean, like, they're all fine. I mean, Bohemian Rhapsody was like, eh, it's okay. I haven't seen it yet, but I was surprised it got Best Picture because it only has like a 60-something Rotten Tomato. I mean, it's like going to a Queen uh, state, like, live concert with not Queen playing. Right. Well, I mean, but it's awesome. You're listening to Queen music for, you know, an hour and a half. Yeah. I don't know. Do you think that Spider-Man's a shoe in for uh, Best Animated? I hope so. Just so they can award it to something that is so visually and artistically stunning and out front. Yeah. Uh, I mean, I feel like that's what that award is for. You know, this is one of those years where I'm like, why isn't that in the Best Picture nomination? Because that might be the Best Picture I saw this year. Really? Wow. I don't I don't feel there. that way. I don't feel it that way. It was in my like top five easily. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Um, you saw the Lego movie too recently. I saw that this weekend. <sighs> Hit me in the feels. Oh, did it? Totally. Good. Yeah, I liked it too. I liked it more than the first one. Um, and I can't it, say that. Yeah, it, it's because it has it has to do, I think we can talk a little bit more about it now. Uh, it has to do with sibling relationships. Mm-hmm. And I have, a, I have a set of those. Yeah. And uh, so it, it mirrored a lot of what I've seen and what it dealt with and contended with at yeah. home. And you were probably longing for part of the resolution of this movie where they worked it out themselves. Well, I, I, yeah, 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 yeah. but, <laughs> but that doesn't happen necessarily yeah. right away. And there's a, there's an interesting twist at the end that, no, I, that, it, that I thought was brilliant. It is very, uh, authentic, I would say. Yeah. Uh, and, uh, one mild spoiler for anyone that stepped on a Lego brick, there is one hell of a payoff for that. See, I, that fell flat for me. Really? Yeah. I didn't think that was funny, and then it, they. I th- no, then the second time was a little much. They, but oh, are are, are we talking it, about the credit scene? Because they echoed, they uh, ran that in the credits. So yeah. let me ask you this: so yeah. there's this exceptional credits sort of animation sequence oh my with God. Lego bricks. I was like, is that? Did is they that, do that for, real? Did they do that is for real? real? <laughs> yes. So I think that's real. I don't think it is. It's way too complicated. But so they had this rotating barrel. This is a spoiler because we're talking about the credits. They had a rotating barrel yeah. that had. Um, slices through it that as the barrel rotated would sort of offer up different scenes that would sort of in motion kind of come together. And I was looking at this, I'm like, this looks really slick animation. Then I started looking and I'm like, I think this is real. And they have all of the characters from the movie represented, but they're built with Legos and not animated. They are yep. still like they would be if they were made from Legos. And you see a couple side shots of from the barrel rolling and it looks like it's in a room. <laughs> yeah. Like like a stage set Dude, kind of room. If that is real, it's a freaking We need the Cinefax breakdown of yeah. whatever happened in that scene cuz that blew my mind. It's one of the wonders of the world because I that needs to be in a museum. Uh, I, there's, I just don't think there's any possible way. It's way too complicated. I think they did it. Because it went on and on and on. No, no, I'm sure there were cuts. I'm sure it's not like one continuous shot, right. like a, like in Gravity or something. But I I'm sh- I think it was real. I like it. See, even if it's not real, I love that it fooled you because the entire first movie <laughs> fooled me. I went down on record. To, like after the movie was over, I leaned over to, to my son and I said, you know, that was entirely stop motion. <laughs> <laughs> this film has been 40 years in the making. Exactly. <laughs> 10 people have exactly. died on set exactly. trying to reproduce these effects. I, I think about that to this day and how anyone who overheard me probably laughed to themselves and said, what an idiot. <laughs> well, at least they, they let you have that moment. Uh, I think it's time to dive into our top story because we had some breaking news. Okay.
top story this week. The Ghost of Norm. So just over an hour ago, Samsung announced its whole new fleet of phones. <laughs> That's right. I'm using the word fleet now to describe this. And so we're going to have some initial reactions to it. I have no reaction. Uh... <laughs> You're going to have a reaction to it. Um, Let's talk about the the basic phones first. Well, I just want to acknowledge, first of all, we're reacting to early information. So if we miss bits and pieces, we'll get to it next week. It's just more that this is like an hour after it's actually, whoa, uh, it's actually happened. Why is that happening? I don't know. My canned coffee just blew up on my lap. It's almost like you shook it up beforehand or something. Ah, this is unfortunate. Uh, Well, while Jeremy is doing that. Let's give the high-level stuff. They announced uh, a number of phones in the S10 series. Well, they had two of them. Three of them. Three. What was the S10e starting at seven forty nine? The S10 starting at eight ninety nine, and the S10 Plus starting at nine ninety nine. Oh, there we go. And then they announced the Galaxy Fold, which has been rumored for a number of. But this is totally different. Let's, let's no, talk. no, no. They had put in rumors of this Galaxy Fold no, coming I know, out. I know, I know. But it's not it's not the same category of phone. No, no. It's not the same category. I'm just like getting out all the stuff they announced. Okay, yes. And then we'll come back to the phones. Um, and and that's really more of a tablet than a full phone. So that's why we should put oh, it in a different... Oh, is it? Oh, interesting. Okay, we're going to have an argument about this. By the way, when I saw Galaxy Fold trending on Twitter, I really thought we had made a real astronomical breakthrough. <laughs> <laughs> and I had just completely forgotten what was going on. I was like, holy yeah. shit, they found a galaxy that folded. Someone get, wormholes are real. Someone get Neil Tyson on the phone <laughs> now. All right, let's talk about the phones. Okay. So the S10s are always, as an Android lover, I'm, I'm not a big Samsung guy because my experience with them historically has been the bloatware on them. But they've always come out as like the most overpowered sets of phones year over year. They're more powered than than the Google phones when they typically come out. What do you mean overpowered? Like a- I mean, they, they have the fastest processor, the newest processor. They usually have the most memory inside of them. They have um, the highest res screen. They have like all the bells and whistles are usually in gotcha. the San- Samsung phone. Uh, for the most part, there's. I mean, we can quibble about a lot of things, but yeah. this phone comes out and punches you in the face, typically. Okay. And and there's no change here. This is the specs on this phone are uh, on these phones are ridiculous. So this isn't just a spec bump, though. That's a whole new architecture, redesigned physical form factor. Mm-hmm. Um, the screen sizes are up. The S10 is up uh, 0.3 inches uh, over last year's. So that means it's now over a six inch phone. It is a 6.1 inch phone. And that it's also because the, the bezels are way down. Like they're just almost non-existent. Mm-hmm. And it looks like they still haven't gone with the notch that they found a way to put the camera behind the display, but by, you have to cut out pixels for it. Mm-hmm. So there's a, there's a hole in the screen where the camera exists. And I don't know, to I like that idea. It means that it's as small as it needs to be. I, I'm fine with the idea, but it means that those pixels that do light up around that space are essentially going to be dead space. Yeah. They're going to light up and just have, like, background color in that space. Right. It's not like that's really usable area on your phone. Yeah, I guess I have not yet seen the display in action, so it remains to be seen what that what the consequences are for that. But at least you, you minimize the intrusion of that of that, you know, hardware in your screen. And by display, do you mean the infinity O... I That's what they call the dynamic AMOLED screen. Oh, really? It's a 3040 by 1440 AMOLED display. Uh, so it is is massive. The weird part that I don't get, I guess I don't I don't understand this in my real life, is they're talking about how it it sends out a lot less blue light, so your eyes will get much less tired from the screen. Right. Like I, the iPhone does the thing where you can turn on night shift. Yeah, Google's phones do the same thing. I guess, I mean, I look at screens all day, and uh-huh. I don't get that effect. I don't get that sort of drying out from the blue light, but everyone seems to accept it. You can buy this. glasses that are yellow tinted that filter it out. You mean blue blockers? Sure. From that infomercial in the 80s? Is that a thing? Blue you blockers? remember the blue blockers infomercial? No. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> I remember Freedom Rock. People tweet at Jeremy with blue blockers commercials on YouTube. From the 80s? Uh, it might have been mid early nineties, but uh, like in uh, that region. Okay. There's a whole rap song about them. Dude, tweet that to me. <laughs> that would be great. Right up there with not the, a good rap song. Don't copy that floppy. Oh, wow. You know that one? No. All right. Tweet that one to Kajor. 
Uh, we're, oh, so, I mean, display is, that's a ridiculous resolution. It has, uh, it's a big ass display. I don't get the, I, I still, I don't get the blue light thing, but I think that yeah. probably has some benefit to uh, people that are going to be using the phone constantly. I think the blue light thing is a bigger deal on your laptop and on your on your uh, desktop screen. Oh, well, people frankly. look at the phone more than any other screen. More yeah, but you're likely. looking at it short term. in a different. Yeah, short term. You're putting it up and down. Yeah. Uh, cameras. Should we talk about cameras? How many cameras does it have? Uh, well, as many as they could fit. They have a uh, six, I think. Yeah, <laughs> I think which is exactly six. <laughs> Uh, it's a ton of cameras. Um, God, where's the thing? So on the S10, uh, there's a dual aperture 12 megapixel camera. I'm really interested in seeing that actually in action with a dual aperture. Um, one is a telephoto uh, lens. I guess it's a telephoto camera because you can't say lens here. And then one's a wide camera. It's I think it's 16 megapixel. Oh, you're uh, right. 100, 100 degree view 120 degree view it's the foldable one that has the six cameras yeah this only has two cameras like a normal phone three uh it three does, yeah three cameras for the s10 and the s10 plus yeah it has a the 12 dual a- aperture camera oh you're counting that as two the uh, dual no it's a dual aperture no right? dude it has a 12 megapixel dual aperture camera a 12 megapixel telephoto camera and an ultra wide 16 megapixel oh. 123 degree camera got it got it got it yeah, and I need the, to see the the camera in action, and th- and then it has the front facing uh, in addition to those. So that's uh, that's quite a lot of lenses. Does it matter to you, um, like going beyond the actual photos for a second, that this can record in HDR ten? <laughs> no, dude. <laughs> know, that's what no. I saw. I was like, what? Why oh, I do it? I you know what though? I think some people do care about that. They're, they're if always... you were like a mobile like video maker. You like know, you're shooting movies on your phone. Even if you're just an enthusiast, like a serious enthusiast level video guy, I think probably there's a side of Norm that likes to push the envelope with the with the video, and I think that he would probably be curious to test that out. Um, it does not. I do. Ever since iPhone has shot in HD, I've been happy. No, yeah, that's all it takes. I mean, the extra features in video, like the time lapse, the slow mo, all that kind of stuff, yeah. are actually more important to me in video. And then the storage associated, just because of uh, of shooting in in HD and now in 4K. Uh, all these cameras will let you do this kind of adjustable focus, uh, so you can blur so you the background yourself. Yeah, more and less. Uh, they'll do a super steady camera feature, which will. Um, that's kind of, it's kind of interesting. Digital stabilization, I'm yeah, guessing, yeah, that's right? exactly what it is. Yeah, stabilization. Um, uh, it claims that it's on par with uh, most action cameras. What does that mean? You know, GoPro. Oh. Um, so, yeah, I don't know. I mean, it's a high-tech camera, as you said, high I mean, specs. We need to see it in action. Um, Are you going to get one? No. Why not? I did just break my Pixel, too. So, so I'm in the maybe. market for a new phone. I just I want to see it tested. Uh, in the real world because i've been blown away by some of the google software features on the phone like night sight you love that. really just is incredible tell people what and that that's, is and that's where you allow it's a software feature that allows like low light um I- images to uh, to it's a sharp long sharper. exposure yeah right yeah so um i've been really blown away and that should be available on this phone just like all of the other uh, uh, flagship Google phones, but I want to see what it looks like yeah. in reality. And so we haven't gotten like that sort of hands-on testing that will come out in the next couple of weeks. Snapdragon 855 inside, baseline six RAM, six gigs of RAM, but now up to 12 on this thing, which is, I, I think, a new high watermark for um, for phones. <laughs> That's like, a lot of RAM. That is a lot of RAM. Like, yeah. Uh, I remember when my PC had four, you know. For what? Gigs. <laughs> yeah, well, yeah. I remember when VC had, had 64 me- kick, uh, yeah, kilobytes. Yeah. The, I wonder, is, is that uh, diminishing returns? Like, I understand six to eight. I don't use anything. Like, I know people actually use, like, I like mean, Photoshop and Lightroom on their phone. And, like... Part of it is this resolution. Like, when you keep cranking up the res, it's like, that is a lot of bytes to store in RAM. And, yeah. it, it, I mean, it's just a matter of... If it's going to be doing any kind of multitasking, that's a lot of stuff. All right. Do you, last week, did you guys talk about the five G nonsense that's going out? 
Uh, like with we, AT&T doing the you know, fake 5G. I, yeah, I'm, I'm aware of it. Uh, yeah, yeah, I'm pretty sure we did. I, sometimes I get confused what was before, what was after we hit the record button. But yes, we certainly did talk about it. Because Samsung did announce there is a 5G version of this phone. Like an actual Like 5G? an actual 5G version of this phone. Oh, wow. That's coming out. And according to them, like the specs aren't terribly different. It's not... We like we think the phone will have to be physically bigger with yeah. a five G chip inside of Why? it. Why? Well, just because the I think the five G hardware is a little bigger. Really? Yeah, but I mean, like physically bigger. I mean, not actually that much bigger. <laughs> and like, <laughs> but it's like they said the five G model looks essentially the same. Okay. Um, I, uh, to I, the non five G model. I, you know, what if five G comes out and no one can tell the difference? <laughs> like that's going to be so sad if if that were the case because it's got so much promise behind it. I have not been excited about a new cell phone technology since like three G. Mm-hmm. Uh, so I I will that would sell me an iPhone because I'll probably stick to with the iPhone for all the sad reasons I have to stick in the iPhone. You know, they got you. They got me and my whole family. But when like that would be a killer feature. If if it comes out and it, it actually does gigabit, like no problem. I don't know. They they did say the the five G phone is six point is the six point seven inch size. Yeah, that's too big. Like that that's starting to get to the size where it won't fit in my front pocket. No, that's, that's where silly. am I putting this phone? I don't know. I don't know why they're why people are chasing that big screen. Mm-hmm. What do you think of the price? The price of these phones? Yeah. That's exactly what I thought it would be. Yeah. yeah they I mean, kept it under 1000 which I actually was a little surprised about exactly. for the high-end one. Like, even the high-end one is, is 1000 Like, they go down from there, and obviously it's all expensive. It's $800 <laughs> and up. But, um, you know, given the cost of the iPhone ten, I think that that's done a lot to raise people's expectations for how expensive mm-hmm. a phone can be. Well, if you're interested in a $1,000 phone, can I interest you in a $2,000 phone? No, I will not go a penny above one thousand nine hundred and eighty dollars. <laughs> okay, well, I can. I think I might be able to get you <laughs> into something at that at that price. It's really two screens in one, Jeremy. Wow, tell me about it. What is it's it? It's the Galaxy Fold. Um, this so is something funny. that's been rumored about for how long? Uh, I don't know, like years sure. now. Foldable and phone. And like, I think people will. Uh, at least I, I did. I confuse it with what we've seen with that Royale Flex Pie. Um, phone that we've seen out at CES a bunch of times. Okay, this is two OLED displays instead of one that curves around, um, and that they're each like nineteen sixty by uh, eight forty, and it literally unfolds and snaps together. Uh, and the images they showed from the stage, it looked like when it snapped together into sort of a tablet formation, you could not see the seam. I. Baked, between the I, two, I think you might be mistaken, and, and, and if you, one of us is, then we should be forgiven because this is right off the presses. Okay. But I think that that screen, the nineteen sixty by eight forty, is the front facing phone screen. Yeah, it's that's the phone screen. But then inside is an entirely separate oh, I said the wrong number, Sorry. isolated yeah. screen, which is the foldable screen. Yeah, which is actually twenty one fifty two by fifteen thirty six. Yes, I was wrong. And, Get used to it. <laughs> and so that, like, it is a foldable phone. But you don't like unfold a screen and yeah. make it bigger. There's just two screens on. Yeah, it. there's two screens. That's and, what I meant by unfolding. Yeah, yeah. But so the in the interior screen you don't see any of while it's collapsed. Oh, that's why there. But there's still this like seam when you flip like unfold it. Well, supposedly not because it is a single screen and this hinge is supposed to be very well designed. So there's no actual seam between the two halves of your folded screen. I guess I don't understand that. Like I saw it sort of like unfurl itself and I guess I don't understand this interlocking gear mechanism that no, I'm talking about inside. I haven't seen the video of it at all. I just have read about it uh, and seen a few photos. It's But it's a foldable phone humongous it's got all the top specs it has a you know the six cameras that i mentioned earlier i believe has the the same amount of ram as the high-end camera or the high-end uh s10 the 12 megabytes um but this foldable screen is is intriguing i mean it's the kind of thing when you see a friend who has one if you have a friend who has two thousand dollars to spend on a phone you will want to see this thing in action all right so like here's the basics of it. You have like a 4.6 inch phone face. Yeah. Um, that's like double thick. It is very reminiscent of like yeah of a phone from about like 10 years very, ago. Very uncomfortably thick, I would imagine. Yeah. yeah. 
And then you unfold it, and like as you unfold it, and this is where I still don't get what how you don't see the seam. Uh-huh. You unfold it like, like, like this, a book. and yeah. and somehow you don't see the seam in the middle. Right. But, uh, be, I get it's a single screen. Yeah. Um, uh, is whatever the seven point three inch size. So you're basically paying for a phone that's four point six inches, that's double thick, and a tablet that's a, a seven inch tablet. Well, in yeah, one, but it, yeah, they're all, it's one device. And so like one of the demos that they gave is that you can pull up Google maps on the small screen, open it up and it's the same location already reflected on the big screen. Like that's, that's it. That's cool. I guess like, I suppose that's exactly what you would expect, but there's not a whole lot of infrastructure built into Android yet to take advantage of those of two screens like that. And so they're just beginning to roll these ideas out. And I, I'm not sure there's going to be so much there that it will be as enticing as it should be. I guess the, there's the one complaint I have, and it, like you should dig me on this. this one is complaint? A, yeah, this it, is one it's complaint. It's got to be the price, right? No, I mean, oh. for, like for giving all of this as like a first to market, it's going to be unreasonably expensive, right. all of that stuff. It's that... Like when you have the tablet open, it looks like a normal tablet uh-huh. for the most part, yeah. right? Fine, fine. But when it's folded in half and you're working on your double thick phone, fine, it's double thick. That's like the laws of physics have to reign somewhere. But you don't get like the full, you don't have like a full width, sc- a full length screen there. Yeah. It's basically only you have this massive bezel essentially are you telling me that the foldable phone is not a great phone or a great <laughs> tablet i might be yeah i I'm, I'm starting to come around to that that that's the problem it might be the case you could probably buy a tablet and a phone for less than 1980 dollars and like tape them together <laughs> <laughs> yeah throw the duct tape in for free <laughs> i I'm really, I mean, a, we're being snarky, but I'm actually really curious to get my hands on this because I, I could imagine a scenario where this would be uh, useful. I'm not one of those people that, that gets out a stylus and, and writes on my phone, but I know a lot of people that do use like the Galaxy Note in that way. Yeah, This could be an interesting gambit for people who use their phone like that as, a, as essentially their only device. Seven nanometer processor. 12 gigabytes of RAM, 512 gigs of storage. That's well, pretty good. Well, that's what it should be. I mean, if it's a tablet, wouldn't you want something in that range? Yeah. I just don't know what to expect anymore. <laughs> you and me both. You and me both. Um, I, I'd love for, if Norm got this into test, I'd be so curious about it. But I, I like have a hard time getting over like what the phone looks like. I just want to see a foldable screen. Like I've never seen one. I've never gone to CES and had my mm-hmm. laid my eyes on this kind of technology. I think once you see it, you'll sit, you'll your mind might turn to ideas where it could be applied in useful, interesting ways. I, I mean, I have dumb questions. Maybe like you know, probably Patrick Norton is like yelling at us as I as I say this. Like, I know OLED as this has this organic you know layer beneath it. Yeah. I'm wondering if like the physical manipulation of the screen at this point, at this at this seam, whatever we're calling it, yeah. wouldn't that degrade that organic layer over time just from the repeated well, mechanical stresses on it? All I know is that the OLEDs from the beginning have had a foldable capability. And so like, Yeah. The, because the organic layer is bendable. Yeah. So I'm sure that there's a limit within which you can bend it safely. And that's probably some of the magic of that hinge. But, you, but that's what I'm saying is like, is it I get that that's the spec for it. Yeah. But is it also like a chair that you can only sit in it so many times before it like just wears out? Like is there a isn't it can be within spec to yeah. like fold it. Right. But it does it wear out after two thousand folds or something like that? I would hate for any technology company to embed obsolescence into their product. I can't mm. imagine that anyone would do no, that. No, but like I, I wonder if they've actually done that kind of test. <laughs> yeah, like if they need a robot that's opened it and closed it, like <laughs> like in times. IKEA where they have like the robot that like sits exactly. in the chair over and over again. I think we've killed this. Should we move yeah, on? Let's go. What do you? We're skipping pop culture this week, aren't we? Yeah, because. Norm's not here to lead the charge on that one. We're going yeah, straight. I, I can't explain you enough to technology. Technology. Whew, I'm glad.
glad we got all that out about a phone because it's time to talk about a phone. <laughs> the LG G8 leaks are out. Ars Technica has um, some of the initial um, photo previews of it. Uh, it's de- it's expected to debut at Mobile World Congress, like which is just in a in a week or so. Uh, this phone look kind of looks like um, uh, an iPhone 10. It has the notch. It's a beautiful big screen, fingerprint sensor on the back, dual camera on the back, um, everything that we expect. OLED display like you would expect from LG. Uh, I can't wait to see the actual specs. This phone looks really gorgeous to me. Huh. I know nothing about it. I'm sure it looks very nice. <laughs> Yep, that's that's about it. I mean, uh, we, we don't have pricing or anything else, but uh, you know, you can take a look at the the preview photos. I think it looks great. Oh, by the way, we didn't mention on the S tens that they have a new fingerprint scanner. Oh yes, it's built into the display. Yeah, it's which is it's neat. We saw a little bit of that. Uh, we saw a phone at CES that had that, which I thought was awesome. I I'm super curious how well that works, especially you know all the fingerprint sensors that exist now break down with like a wet finger or anything else like that. Yeah, and since this is using much more optical information, from what I understand, maybe mm-hmm. yeah. I don't know. Okay, uh, it'd be interesting how it works. Um, I have more to say about the G8, except it's coming. Our friends at Facebook almost completed a purchase See, underneath our nose. <laughs> but not anytime recently. This is an interesting... This is... I was uh, thinking about... Maybe we should just put this in the VR Minute because it is tied to that. Um, there's a, a book that came out yesterday or this week by Blake Harris called The History of the Future, which he's the, his, he's the author of Console Wars, which is an excellent book, came out, I don't know, five years ago that I listened to on an uh, audiobook, and it's uh, now being turned into a miniseries. He's a, he's a good author, and this new book is about the history of Oculus. Oh, from like the early Palmer days through the yeah. acquisition? As, through... as, as far as I can tell, and I, I have the book on order. It should be arriving tomorrow. I can't wait to read it. It is uh, largely about Oculus during Palmer and, and uh, up until the point where he leaves or was ousted. And um, it's so interestingly, like, it doesn't sound like it's so much about current day uh, quest and such, look, forward looking. Um, it was, it's an interesting story behind the making of the book because he was given a ton of access to Oculus, like unfettered access to the company, even after the Facebook acquisition, um, where he would come into the campus and talk to all the executives, carte blanche, ask any questions he wanted, had um, access to a lot of uh, emails that were not made public, other, you know, beyond Oh, him. wow. And um, one of the emails that he was given access to, anyway, the, the, the end of that story was he was then cut off and uh, all his access was curtailed. And um, the, the book does not take a positive, exclusively positive slant on, on the company. And so it, How could it? Like, I mean, with, it was rife with, yes. with, with drama. D- Carmack come out recently saying, um, probably much to the chagrin of Facebook PR, what he's read of the book, this was before it was released, is all factually correct. And so, you know, he's given him a lot of credibility. The story that you mentioned is um, was mentioned in an email years ago. I, I want to say like 2015, um, which was released by uh, TechCrunch, uh, sent to them by the author of the book and released in its entirety on TechCrunch. Yeah, it's uh, from June 22nd, 2015. And it's a long email from Mark Zuckerberg to executives at Oculus and elsewhere in the, in Facebook about his vision for VR and why they want to be in that space. So this is right after the acquisition. And on page three or four of this, of this email, he just on a side mentions that they're considering buying unity. So this is clearly something they had, they had been <laughs> discussing inside the company. Hey, prior what do to you that. think of that unity thing? Well, apparently that was like, this is way deep into the discussion. Like they have wow. discussed this for a long time and he just starts to reflect on why that would be such a good idea. They, so they apparently Facebook seriously um, considered buying, perhaps even made an offer to unity uh, which of course never came to pass, and Unity is is, is doing quite well. Uh, they're probably happy being independent still, but um, I mean they're still pre IPO. I think they're gonna yeah. try next year. Or That's something what I've like read that. too. Yeah, you know, multi multi billion dollar uh, IPO, 
And it's just interesting that Facebook was considering buying that company after buying Oculus. Like they were, they were considering going on this acquisition spree of becoming a just like a the VR um, machine. That uh, I mean, in, I guess it would have it would have pushed people more to their platforms. I could that's, imagine. Did you read the 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 email? Because that's exactly it. Like they wanted to embed Facebook services into Unity, uh, and and make them the easiest to use and um, you know the lowest barrier to entry for any developer and uh, he, even like to the extent of like he implied that they could choose how much to support you know the other guys um, and he, even you know with Unity being uh, used to design games for iOS and other platforms um, they said that they would never overtly like refuse to support them but they could choose how much they wanted to what a gigantic shift that would have been i mean yeah. we probably wouldn't see much from a user at this point because if you look at like whatsapp and instagram are we feeling much of that acquisition in those spaces yet a little bit right no i'd be curious though um, yeah. because the other part of this of this email and this is much more on the vr side was about Oculus. And it was like, why do we want to be in this space? And what are we doing? And, and they wanted to accelerate the adoption of VR, not just so that they so that they could get to the point where VR was a sustainable business, but because they want to get past the mobile generation. They see, and as many people do, VR as the, um, you know, the next great computing platform after mobile. And the fastest way to get there is to accelerate VR adoption. And so they, because they see Google and Apple as being the forerunners in that space, they cannot compete with them. And they want to own the hardware this time, the platform itself, which, and all the services. So they, that's how they saw Oculus and Unity combined as the way to get there. And uh, it, it's just a fascinating email from four years ago. I would love to see a leaked email from today and see their thoughts on it now. But uh, I, I highly recommend it. It seems like an it. interesting book to read. Well, this is just an email. Yeah, I mean, this is just an excerpt <laughs> yeah. to build excitement for yes. the book, right? That's why Absolutely. the author re released it. So I'm sure there's going to be details about Palmer Split and all of that kind of stuff, too. I, there's emerge. a lot about that in the book. Yeah. The, uh, we'll talk more about this in the VR Minute. How about that? Yeah, okay. sounds good. I am a fan of not tying my shoes. And by that, I mean I love any other system of elastics or, or ratchets, anything that I don't have to tie my shoes. I mean, Velcro, and, right? It's been around since we were kids. Uh, yeah, m my kid still uses them. Yep. And earlier this year when we talked about a story about Nike releasing a self-lacing, self-tightening really, uh, set of shoes for $350 that would connect to your app mm -hmm. and uh, just give you the right tightness based off of where you were going. Like, no, the, no, the, now I'm making up stuff. The, Goldi but, the Goldilocks tightening. Yeah. It would just, it would be perfect. Yeah. Well, this week we got a story out of The Verge that's actually just sourced in the, in the Google Play Store that uh, Android users are having problems pairing one of their shoes. I, I can't remember if it's the left or right shoe with the app. And so they cannot <laughs> tighten their shoe. <laughs> but they can tighten the other one? Oh, that's too bad. I mean, it is like symbolic of our of, of the world we live in that oh. I can't lace my shoes now because my app, my app is like Internet of Things. It's funny, but it's not funny. Oh, it's because all, it's this funny. is going to be me soon. Because I, <sighs> I knew, like when Norm first mentioned that story months ago, I was like, three hundred fifty bucks isn't that much. I mean, we are talking some Nikes. Yeah, Nikes, dude. Oh, I mean, so uh, bad. You, you're the sports fan. I mean, could you see ESPN like people on there saying these shoes are great because when I'm up at the plate, or I guess, what do you what do you do? You're playing basketball. So, like, when I'm on the what is it, a basketball court? When I'm on the court, I can adjust, I can hit the button, and I get the court tightness. And when I go for my free throw because someone fouled me, I can loosen it up a bit. Like, do you see that actually being useful to people? No. Oh, huh. like who needs that level of adjustment in their life? I'm I need to relax now. Shoelaces untighten just a little bit. Yeah, give me a four on those right now. That's silly. I'm going on a run. Give me a 10. 
I think they went. See, I understand that. Like, I understand like needing a really tight sort of customized fit. Yeah. For athletes, you do during their performance, but not adjusting them on the fly because that's part of the pitch. Yeah, is that I can do that? I don't know. They need the self drying jacket, then you can go full Marty McFly. We're getting there. No, exactly. getting there. I we have so. to check on the juicer, smart juicer market, see where the where that's going. Not juicer. What was it? Mr. Fusion. Mr. Fusion. Yeah, we got to check in and see <laughs> juicer. What was that thing? It was a. Uh, it was a Cuisinart. Quiz- yeah, that's yeah. what it was. That was it was close. Yeah. All right. The Toy Fair was this weekend. Oh, dude! It's still isn't it still happening? It might still be happening. I saw there was some amazing toys that came out. Like Kenner came out with some old school sets. Super Seven has a bunch of cool He Man stuff, like He Man oh. the movie stuff. The really beautiful action figures. Right. Um, the the one thing that caught my eye is something that I can't imagine tested not covering at some point because it it, it embodies Lego and augmented reality. <laughs> which <laughs> is your mouth watering right now. <laughs> it just seems like it's like what how many times do you see two of tested's uh, you know f- core but, core competencies like combined together. into a but single toy. To, you have to unpack it a little bit. AR to do what? Like so you build a kit. <laughs> Yes, yes. You you build the kit. Apple already demoed this on on stage. Like when they were talking about AR kit and what an amazing future we had in front of us, they brought Lego on stage and they brought they put their phones in front of a Lego set and you saw the figures and the whole scene come to life. So and now, then it turned into like a, a game or something like that, right? Yes, exactly. So so but so that's what this is. It's an AR kit enabled app that um, you load up on your phone. And if you buy one of, what is it, we got eight kits, you build the kit, you put the phone in front of the kit, apparently some of the, some things will come to life. Now, all of the kits are haunted themed. Yeah. Actually, you can't, I don't know if you can tell that, like the, the sets are called uh, Hidden Side and the... So they're like ghosts that pop out of these yes. things? So the different sets are high school, train, bus, diner, truck, graveyard, boat, and lab. Now, graveyard, obviously, yeah. is going to have some haunted school aspects bus? to it. Yes. All of these are, are haunted to some degree. Now, school bus is actually the third most expensive one. High school at 1,400 pieces, 1,474 pieces is 130 bucks. So it seems like on par with standard Lego pricing, but you've got on top of that this cool app feature. And interestingly, for the AR perspective, it works as you would hope. You don't need to put down a QR code. You don't need to have any kind of uh, you just fidu- hold- fiducial marker. You build the sets, and then you point the phone at, at certain aspects of it, and apparently they will come to life. And there's this game you play where ghosts appear, and you have to find all the ghosts. Obviously, they should have gone with a Ghostbusters theme, but maybe it would be too expensive. I don't know. Um, but it, the graphics look good. It seems like the technology's come up a bit since we've last seen AR with toys. And the fact that you can just build the sets as normal and then you get this app on top of it seems like it's a better synergy. It's not like one needs the other necessarily, but they do work well together. It all depends on what that experience in AR is like to justify it. But do, like even if it's bad, you still get the set and you still build it as normal. And they're good looking sets. Uh, it's all, you know, regular Lego stuff. And the the haunted aspects to, the, like, the graveyard, it's a neat-looking set. Um, but you're right. Like, I, what I'm curious about is how well does the AR integrate into the reality? And apparently, like, you do have to move around the actual Lego pieces. That's so it, cool. It's not like it all takes place on the screen. And I think that's crucial to make this thing actually make sense and feel good is for the AR to involve real stuff that you physically move around. See what I want and this is this is totally science fiction is the AR Lego app that you can set out a bunch of pieces and it like looks at them and gives you suggestions on what to build with oh them. Oh my god, that's amazing. <laughs> right? Because that's what's in the Lego movie is like you see the part numbers and come the, up. Like a beautiful mind they all yeah. highlight I love this idea. And then they could actually like arrange themselves and like give you suggestions. That's a great idea, Kishore. That's where imagination comes from, an app guiding you towards it. <laughs> I mean, that, that is the future. Why not? Do it. Make it so, Lego. Let's take a break to get a message from our friend Norm. Oh, absolutely. I would love to do that. Let's see what we got. I better turn his mic up a little bit. 
This week's episode of This Is Only A Test is also made possible by Molecule. We've all heard of HEPA filters. We use them in our workshops and even our homes, but that's pretty old technology. Thankfully, Molecule has introduced a breakthrough science that is finally capable of destroying air pollutants at a molecular level. Molecule's technology goes beyond HEPA filtration. It captures and completely destroys the full spectrum of indoor air pollutants, including those 1,000 times smaller than what a HEPA filter can catch. In fact, in a study of 49 allergy sufferers presented at the American College of Asthma, Allergy, and Immunology, Molecule technology provided dramatic, statistically significant symptom reduction within a week of use. One customer even said she was able to breathe through her nose for the first time in 15 years. Molecule technology has been personally effective and verified by science, but most importantly, it's been tested by real people. Molecule has already helped allergy and asthma sufferers around the country better cope with their conditions and significantly reduce their symptoms. As you've heard on the podcast, we've been setting up a nursery for our new baby, and we're pretty paranoid about the air in that room, especially since it's just a few floors above where I'm running my laser cutter. So having the molecule in the nursery has given us some extreme peace of mind. Now, for $75 off your first order, visit molecule.com, that's M-O-L-E-K-U-L-E.com, and enter the code TEST at checkout. Molecule, the air you were meant to breathe is finally here. Now back to the show. Now it's time for a moment of science. All right. I, I think most listeners know I used to work at uh, the University of California, San Francisco, and there was a researcher there um, that early in the um, like 2000s, maybe in like closer uh, to the mid 2000s, yeah. started doing work um, essentially transferring the blood of younger mice into older mice and seeing what the effects on aging. Good Scott. Uh, yeah, yeah. This sounds really morbid, but it's actually pretty cool. Um, to seeing what the effects of like blood itself has on aging properties Uh because we, we talk about aging as just me looking like this year over year and just looking worse. Yeah. But aging is this complex sets of properties that are happening at the cellular level as well. Vampires know all about this. Yeah, absolutely. So this is definitely a macabre kind of study, but it actually pointed to some benefits of this kind of transfusion. And uh, so science, Science has been exploring this kind of area for a while, but also ancillarily, a lot of pseudoscience BS has popped up in this in this area and concept. I think mostly fueled by sports. A lot of athletes have gone and gotten young blood transfusions young blood. in in certain like areas, like around <laughs> their their patella and all of these kinds of things, as a way to reverse certain ailments and conditions. Uh, The FDA this week had to come out and issue a warning, stop doing this, stop buying young blood from people on the market because there's so many companies just literally selling blood. Uh, And it's very um, manipulative. How how much does a pint of blood cost? uh, It can be up to $8,000 a liter. Dude, what? No, we shouldn't put this out there. People will sell their blood. No, it's not good. I mean, like, there are literally companies selling blood, a uh, young blood, as a way to reverse Alzheimer's. Oh, it's awful. Aww. And so I, I just wanted to tell you that because, like, the FDA issued this sort of like warning about this. And I think there's going to be some crackdowns. But it also points to, like, there's this underlying research about what the heck is going on. But the research is very all over the place. They're trying to understand sort of fundamental conditions of aging. Uh, well, wait, there's what, a fascinating what, what, set of of how these two areas like are interlinked. Like the scientific research has bled into the pseudoscience <laughs> world. Has it bled? Yeah, I really was trying to get there the Did, whole time. It took me a while. What about the mice experiment? Uh, So the mice experiment pointed to all sorts of interesting conditions that we saw slowing down in certain aging processes, but it was very early work. And Uh like that work has progressed over the last decade and I'm not up to date on like the latest paper in it, Okay, but essentially it's very incremental, small, like we're trying to understand why it isn't like transfusions of blood make a difference. They're being like, if we transfuse this blood, 
what do we see change in the processes happening? Okay. And they're interested in the change in processes, not necessarily what the transfusion of blood is all about. Right. Uh, that was a, a, yeah, there are diagrams of that experiment that I do not recommend leading. When I hear the word young blood, I think of Bruce Willis because my very first CD that I ever owned was um, like The Return of Bruno. I want to say that's the name of the album. He During his Moonlighting like, yeah. era, he released a CD where he's a blues artist and it's this fake return of an artist. He, it was his first album. But on there, I think there's a song called Young Blood and he sings it. This is the first CD you owned? Yes. It's not a good first CD. Just prior to Sgt. Pepper's Lonely Hearts Club Band. So oh, I mean, second CD. Slight, Whoa. slight increase in quality. See, I yeah. uh, Dark Side of the Moon was my first CD. Wow. Which is amazing. Uh, and then I got a BMG membership. And then it all... Oh, it's all downhill. All yeah. downhill. Um, all right. Two more stories. Why do zebras have stripes? That sounds like a children's book story. No, no, no. It's, it's, it, let me guess. It's because when they run in packs, uh, their predators can't um, discern one from the other. Yeah, so David Attenborough taught me that years ago. Oh. And it's true. That is actually true. That we see the th- them in that pack mentality creates confusion amongst, amongst their predators. Yeah. Well, researchers wanted to study what it looks like if we gave other horses zebra stripes. So they created basically the first ever horse cosplay that I'm aware of where they knitted like a zebra (laughs) outfit um, and put them on these horses because they wanted to study if it has more impacts than just on predators. And what they studied is horse flies and how they uh, actually try to – horse flies actually are named that because they surround horses and they try to bite them. Yep. And they looked at how many flies were able to bite horses once they put on their zebra cosplay. But that's what the ho- horse flies bite them when they're standing still. The whole point of the zebra stripes is when they're moving. So what they found is the flies aren't able to process the the contrast in the colors uh-huh. and were uh, visibly uh, 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 confused as to the location of the animal I'm, I'm gonna because say, they see in grayscale. This is not good science. What do you mean? It's not good science. It's a, by the way, this is the top story in the New York Times science section. Terrible science. But it's a story about horse flies being confused, not about what. No, no, it's not about why zebras have stripes. I just okay. titled that because I think that's a, a fun way to title the story. Uh, did you see the um, the video clip of somebody wearing a horse mask and a horse thinking it was another horse? No. And then, and then he takes the horse mask off, and the horse just freaks out. So what the hell is? This? I would freak out too. And just walks the other way with his head, saying no, no. Sorry, I said is this a real thing? Yes, it's a real thing. It's also, also the Dayquil talking. So okay. I apologize. Well, here we go. Third Dayquil story coming up. Have you ever microwaved a grape? Marshmallow, yes. Grape, no. You are missing out. What happens? Uh, so if you have a grape, but leave a little like skin connected between the two halves and put it in the microwave, you essentially are going to create a plasma arc. Uh, it will arc from one grape to the other. Do I need to cut the grape open? It's better if you cut the grape open and leave a little skin connected. That's when you get like the best arc oh, yeah. typically. Uh, but you can also just put two grapes like next to each other typically and, and get that effect. Um, but Why? you need a little like separation. Why does this happen? So for the longest time, people thought it was the electrolytes in the grape were absorbing the microwaves um, and bouncing back and forth and generating enough energy to essentially create a plasma. That plasma will then arc into wow. another area. It's like you're almost creating a circuit inside of your microwave. Cool. It's a really cool effect. It's spectacular to look at. Um, and as long as you're smart about it, you won't destroy your microwave. Researchers have been studying this effect and wondering if that explanation is true. And what they found is not true in the way we thought. It's the microwave beam is not getting stuck inside the grape and bouncing around within the electrolytes. It's actually getting stuck in the space between the two grape halves. Well, that would mean you have to have the grape in the right spot. It is. So there are hot spots yeah. in the microwave where this wouldn't happen. And so it's sort of bouncing back and forth between the grapes, and then it would generate the arc between the two. That's good science. Yeah, it was pretty good. There's a video. I'll put it. 
uh, in the in the show notes for people, and then you can you can watch it. It's pretty great. It's pretty great. Ugh, I'm on a roll <laughs> do, here. Do you uh, recommend eating a microwaved grape? No, I wouldn't think That's so. That's awful. Right. Frozen grape, though. The VR minute, virtual reality this week. That guy, you can't get away from him. He's everywhere. Everywhere. So we mentioned the book, The History of the Future by Blake Harris. The um, first book in the VR book club, Projections Book Club. <laughs> oh, yeah. I mean, I imagine it's going to be read by a lot of people who follow this stuff. I'm excited to read it. Um, I, I checked out the audio book, and I was not a fan of the of the cadence. So I'm, I went... I went uh, dead tree. Do you worry that, I mean, there's a lot of books that uh, focus on, you know, conflict in businesses and, you know, even the, like the, the great well-reviewed biographies of Steve job, uh, Steve jobs tends yeah. to highlight the, the moments of drama because that's what sells books. Yeah. Do you think this is going to exaggerate, the situation and all. Are you worried about that? You know, I don't mind that. I mean, it, it the first book, Console Wars, was loaded with dramatizations because it's based on ancient history. Like it was based on the, the Sega versus Nintendo Wars. So he had to reenact, you know, quote unquote, reenact a lot of this stuff. I, I don't think this book is filled with that much reenactments, but it's, uh, and I, 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 from what I understand, as I'm about to say, he did an AMA on Reddit. And it, what he, I think, at one point said in there is that that's a different style in this book and that it's much more based on just re- relaying facts. And because it's all happening right now in real time, um, it was a different style than his last book. So I, you're right. He, maybe he will amp up some of, the, some of that. And, but you know what? That's good storytelling. Mm-hmm. As long as it remains factually correct, I'm happy. Um, some interesting tidbits that he relayed in the AMA about Facebook, about Oculus. Somebody asked him, um, "Does uh, what were Zuck's expectations for VR, and have we met them?" Right, like almost five years later. And interestingly, um, when Oculus or when Facebook was courting Oculus, Zuck said to um, then Brendan Uribe, the um, CEO, "If we, quote, if we don't work together." then it won't make sense for us to build for your platform for at least five years until it reaches 50 to 100 million units. Right? So this is sort of like the... You That's know, an interesting if, number. If, you don't, if we don't work something out, we're not going to work on your platform. But more importantly, this says what his expectations are for where we are now. We are not at 50 to 100 million units, friend. We are a small percentage of that. What number do you think we're at? Are we at I would, two to four million units, maybe? Sure. Somewhere yeah, in there? But I would say like VR. Like yeah. a, maybe, I don't know. I, I really don't know. I know that Gear VR and, and Go, are, mm-hmm. for the cost, they are they have far outsold the Rift. Um, PSVR has done rather well. But um, for the their flagship headset, they are nowhere near that. And um, I imagine that the quest will help to start turn things around because we'll be able to combine the best of both worlds of six degrees of freedom with um, mobile, always in VR, ready to go, headset user friendly. Um, you know, it w- remains to be seen what kind of power the quest really has and is it going to satisfy developers. But I think my hunch is that they will scale things down. It won't have the detrimental impact people are concerned about, and we will have a a good experience. I my fingers are crossed. I hope Quest is the turning point for VR going mass market. But I, I also don't trust that number that you threw at the fifty a hundred million. Yeah. Because it was a number that you said was cited while courting. Yes, no, absolutely. Right? So absolutely. like what is the likelihood well, that that is a, a hyperbolic number? I, I I actually think that he thought that was possible. Because mm-hmm. I think five years seems like a lot to people dealing with technology. Mm-hmm. And it's always the thing that you don't expect. Like it's it's always um, the adoption of some technology um, that is r- super fast and the other thing takes a long time. So it's it's hard to tell sometimes what's gonna be the success. And I imagine that he was hoping, best, you know, ideal scenario. As amazing as virtual reality was, I mean, at this point he had tried like the Valve Room, you know, the, mm-hmm. the, 
that the famous room that they built using the uh, um, the symbols along the, around the walls and you know walking on a plank out into the middle of a room textured with web pages that made you feel a sense of vertigo like having sent having seen that having been one of the few people in the world that had tried modern vr i could imagine saying yeah if we make this into a consumer product we will sell 50 million within five years that didn't that doesn't seem crazy to me mm -hmm. so yeah i don't know i thought that was an interesting tidbit um to see what his expectations were compared to where they ended up um uh also, what it, um, let's catch up on. on uh, is there anything else? Yeah, yeah, to... no, I wanted to mention one more quote from this AMA. Um, this one's a little on, on the downside. Um, somebody asked him, "How much does the Oculus of 2009 resemble the Oculus of 2014?" Along the same lines. Yeah. Um, and the author responded with a quote from somebody who works at Oculus, saying, "I won't presume to." give you that answer, but I will give you a quote from an early Oculus employee, quote, finished. I feel an immense sense of loss. It feels like nothing in there exists anymore. It really is history. Hmm. So I, I, back to the- That's a devastating quote. Back to the notion that this book is not 100% positive on Facebook slash Oculus and why his access was cut. Um, it will be interesting to read. I'm excited to it. It's to also it. like, I, I'm not surprised by that quote, given yeah. everything we've seen. All right, so let's do a uh, a lightning round of VR There's news. There's a lot. There is a lot. So well, that's why we got to run through it. Well, I mean, you know. No, we got time. time. Okay. We time. So Norm and I had tried the Vario headset. Oh, you've tried this thing. Not the release, not this one, but we tried a prototype. So this is this, a high res headset. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So we this is a company out of Finland and they've designed is a company uh, the company's called Vario, V A R J O. And um, they have uh, finally announced their headset. They're calling it the VR-1. And do you have any idea how much a professional high-end VR headset should cost? I mean, just extrapolating from what we know, I would say 2500 No, this is a $6,000 virtual reality headset. Holy crap. Yes, with no audio capability. Like, there's no built-in headphones. Well, obviously, and like we we don't look at that number through the lens of like a consumer product. This is a so. Let me tell you why they are charging that amount. Yeah. Um, oh, by the way, you also need to pay a nine hundred ninety-five dollar per year license for software and warranty. Okay. okay? Sure. It's mandatory. Sure. So this is not for consumers. Mm -hmm. I, and I know a lot of people are like, well, what do I care? Let, you should care because this is the hardware inside. This right? is the future. This kind of thing comes down in price eventually, works its way into the consumer marketplace. This headset is very unique, right? It has a basically a Vive Pro um, resolution field of view display that is just like the background. And that's what you, that's just always there. You look around, it's, it's what basically fills your periphery. But then in the center, they have used an optical combiner to put a high resolution display in the center, rectangular with, with soft edges that, that blend into the, the other screen. And that high resolution display, gosh, what is the resolution of it? It is um, 20 times the resolution of the Vive Pro headset, 3000 pixels per inch. And it is like retina quality. It is, it is what they're saying, it is this human eye resolution. Like such that you can't discern. So is it higher. sit in your center of field of view? It is always center. It's almost like a fixed foveated rendering, right? Like the Oculus, oh, yeah. like the Oculus Go. It's always going to be best in the center. So if you want to focus on something, you turn your head and you look at it, and the thing that you're that you're looking towards is uh, ultra high resolution. This is actually kind of like what it feels like to wear glasses in some way, right? <laughs> yeah. Like like at the edges, it's like slightly less yes. resolution, right? In the center. It looks sharp. Yeah, but it, it be, this is a little bit different than that. But yeah, you're I right get that because it's it's actually much less of your field of view than the glasses than glasses mm -hmm. are. So it would be like wearing very small glasses. Yeah, very small glasses um, with like trans translucent rims. Mm -hmm. But I I gotta tell you, like Norman, and I both tried this headset. I wish he was here so he could weigh in on this. But it is one of the most memorable VR experiences I've ever had. Like wearing new hardware because it it was the highest resolution 
And I, it was did, beyond what I expected what we were capable of, of making it yet. Did they build demo software or were you doing something that exists? They, the- they built their own demo software. So what was what was happening in they, the screen? Was stuff like coming from your periphery out into the middle? What, like what was that experience? One of, one of the th- most amazing things was a photogrammetry that they had mm-hmm. scanned. So they, they scanned a shop with... Uh, SLR cameras, and they, uh, it was just one of the best photogrammetry things I've, like, I didn't even think it was volumetric at first, because it was so sharp and well done. Like, the, usually with photogrammetry, geometry is very bulbous and mm-hmm. sort of incorrect, and this was really good. And um, so I looked around, and eventually, like, I, I just leaned, and I said, oh, I didn't realize this was volumetric. And so I, I could really lean into things and check things out, and I, like, the amount of, like, you're looking at instrumentation and detail that you would see in the real world with that center area of the lens and it really is just like perfect like it's what you want from it's it's the dream it's like what you want from from vr i'm kind of surprised by this because i've heard you talk about like yeah we want to be able to read text yeah yeah we get that right but um i can't remember if we did this on the podcast or over lunch like we were talking about like the different things that we could have in VR, whether yeah. it's you know higher resolution like we're talking about here, or eye tracking for a better kind of social experience. And I, you weren't the one that said higher resolution was where it's at. No, no, no. I, I guess what I meant was it's not where my priorities are mm-hmm. because what you really want is the entire screen to be high res, mm-hmm. not a subset of it, like not an optically combined screen in the center. Um, you really want the whole screen and then you want foveated rendering to resolve the pixels where sure. you're looking. But we are like so if this costs six thousand dollars, we're like it, we're so far away from having a full resolution screen everywhere that I, I it's not even on my radar. Like I think there's much shorter term games to be made with eye tracking. Um that I that would interest me. Did this sort of set up this optical combining, did you like catch it or was it like seamless enough that you didn't notice it. No, you you can totally tell. The, that said, they said they were going to improve it. We saw a demo a year and a half ago. So they and oh. the size of that center screen is larger now than the one that we saw. So I would love. I can't wait to see this. Like hopefully we'll be able to do that at some point this year and uh, report back on it. Um, I was very impressed when I saw it. I'm glad to see they finally come to market. I am shocked by the price, but. These are people no, designing a, automobiles. I mean, this is not something that is re, that is for consumers. And I, I think it's going to be perfect for people like working in the military who want to do simulators where you need to see instrumentation. Um, it really is for applications that aren't even on my radar. I look at this. This is, I mean, they can call it whatever they want. This is essentially a developer kit. Sure. Yeah. It uses SteamVR2 tracking. Um, so that's, you know, ready to go. Uh, and if you have a chance, I'd watch their promo video because it's, uh, extremely well done. The, the Finns have a knack for uh, combining art and technology. And, uh, I think the video speaks to it. So that's, that's cool. They finally came to market, um, or are coming to market this year. Um, if you have a Oculus Rift, uh, CV1, Mm -hmm. and it has lost audio in one of the speakers, uh, Palmer Lucky has a fix for you. And if you've gone through the rigmarole of contacting support and support saying you are out of warranty, sorry, can't help you, you can forward that correspondence to Palmer and he will send you for free a kit to fix your rift. Why is he doing this? Well, I... I mean, no, I mean, it's he, rhetorical, but one, like... he feels some responsibility for yeah. the headset. Like Especially he, that headset. That said, he has no responsibility for the, for for supporting you, the company. That's the company, and he obviously is, has taken it upon himself to uh, earn some goodwill and be a good guy. And he is helping you out. He's helping what, anyone. What's out in this repair problem. kit? Apparently, it's a technical, like a from an engineering standpoint, it's rather simple. You need to connect the grounds between the two uh, speakers. And uh, that solves the problem. Apparently, like, there's just a trace or something that, or a, a conductor that doesn't last over time. And so he found a way to uh, fix it and that he thinks anybody can do. And he's sending it out for free. 
Now, you, obviously, you can't just email him and get one. You have to go through this process, send the correspondence. But I think it's great. I think he's, he's helping people out. If there's anyone out there who has a rift without sound, and there certainly are people, because he asked a ton of people on Twitter and Reddit to send him the broken ones. So he could test fixes. So he could test the fixes. By the way, he reimbursed everyone who sent him one with enough money to buy a new rift in their country. He's being a good guy. Being okay. A good guy. So good on good on Palmer for doing that. I think that's that's super cool. And I, but the question is, how long will he be able to offer these? Don't know because eventually, I, who knows how many there actually are? Exactly. But eventually, like all these rifts, might end up developing these problems over the over the coming months, years. Mine luckily hasn't had this problem. Me too. So. We got a new VR release from the folks at ILM X Lab. Oh, this is just I'm, say, I'm, say I'm, the name. I'm say excited the name. about a lot of VR news. I'm not excited about this one. This is Project Porg, right? So these are the little flying dudes from the Last Jedi. Mm-hmm. You see the movie? Yeah, the puffin based creatures. <laughs> right? Not bad. Not, bad. Right? not bad. Um, you know, I just I Star Wars. They promote their animated characters, I think, like BB-8 and Porgs, because they don't have to pay any money. Like, they don't have to buy, buy anyone's rights no. to their voices or or likenesses. This is just free. If somebody wants to make a product, they can use Porgs or BB-8 and get away with it. Or probably even Chewbacca, and they're, like, done. They're just out the door. Or R2-D2. It's all free. It's like these are characters that they own entirely. That's what. That's how I feel about it. Oh, I, I see I have, it differently. I have no. I have no love for porgs. I just think there's there's limited like permutations of what you can do with them. So it's a simpler design. Like I can't do like Project First Order Trooper without like having interactions with them in <sighs> some way. Like a porg is just gonna like eat food and hang out with you. It's right. like it's your Pokemon. Well, you got it. It's a to- it's a Tamagotchi. Right. Yeah, do you remember that? Yeah. So this is that's exactly what it is. It's uh, it 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 is on, uh, Magic Leap, right? And it's uh, you look into the world and you see a porg, and it has a baby, and the baby Aww. hatches, and you have a laser pointer, and you can make it run around your room, and you can give it food, and you take care of it, and you can just love your little porg. This seems fine. Does it? It's not great, but it seems fine. You're fine. It, you're right. It seems fine. Uh, I think it's like, like it's oddly, we see, this is not the first time we've seen an app that seems like it would be appealing to children, but magically does not al- suggest no. the device yeah. be, be used on children. All right. All right, so I picked that one. So you pick one that's going to be more <laughs> soothing, more exciting. Uh, the PSVR will change dramatically. Uh, is a story shared by Norm, and it's a non-story. <laughs> uh, apparently, um, Sean Layden, uh, he told uh, Game Informer that the next 10 years of the PSVR's development will be dramatic. Um, and that is all there is to that story. We don't know any details about why. I suppose it's good that they're showing a commitment to VR beyond this life cycle, that they see it as taking 10 years to, to become interesting. That's great. Uh, the, the long game is fine. I think, w- what are we, like two or three years away from a, a new console, PS5? Uh, how far away can we be from that? Because it feels like we're mid-generation yeah. with PS4, uh, if not later than that. That's when it gets interesting, because does that mean that's the point where we're going to get new PSVR hardware? Oh, uh, right. Yeah. That, that would be great, dude. I mean, if because it really then, was uh, a part of the ground up PS5, that would be great. Yeah. Then you have all sorts of things. You're going to have a more powerful system, ground up building. Uh, then I think, and then you're also getting a whole slew of people coming uh, to buy the console from the ground up too. Yeah. So you might as well have this. So you, your adoption rates can go through the roof. Um. Sean Layden is the chairman of, of SIE Worldwide. He's the guy you see do all of the uh, announcements at E3. Um, what else we got? We got some more. Th- Two last here. stories. Um, well, we Mattel ha- AR. Mattel From AR. The Mattel released an AR app that's a Pictionary game. Tell me about it. Uh, <laughs> they basically have... <laughs> I can't believe I'm talking about this story. Did you read it? 
Uh, I did. Oh, um, good. Tell me about it. But basically, you know, you played Pictionary before. I oh, love Pictionary. Well, now uh, Mattel has a AR app that as your that you can draw in the air, and it'll render on like a tablet or phone that's like looking at you as to the drawings that are being created. Oh, that's interesting. Yeah, it's super interesting. So it's called Pictionary Air. So instead of drawing on a physical thing, you're just drawing into the space. I wonder how that feels to the drawer. They actually have like a specialized pen that's like a light pen. It's weird. So the, the drawer can't see the drawing, but everyone else can. Exactly. I love it. This is a really good idea. Uh, yeah, I don't know. Because like, isn't part of the experience of drawing is seeing what you've dri- dr- uh, drawn already to guide you on what you draw next? Of course it is. But that's that's the comedy of this idea is that you can't. And, and there will be people with more imagination than others. Have you ever done like a, a time lapse with a flashlight or a light stick? To do a light, light drawing? Yeah. yeah. Like yeah. Something like that. Like that's exactly the same thing. Except without the time lapse. Without the time, yeah. left. Well, although it it does take place over time, yes, and uh, everyone else can see immediately. So you will be getting live feedback from people whether or not you are being silly, good, or bad. I'm a fan. This is a good idea. Okay, thanks for telling me about this. So I assume it works on just any any tablet, like. Yeah, I believe so. It looks like they're using some kind of a tool to draw with, though. Doesn't you it? have to download an app, and then it, like you, you get a light pen. That's what it comes it's, with. It's just literally like a stick with a light at the end. I bet you could use. You could probably just use a flashlight or something. Like yeah, that. I mean, it, it's probably picking up on the color. Yeah. Um, for some reason, but whatever. Uh, Is this more Toy Fair stuff? And uh, yeah, I believe it is Toy That's Fair. Cool. Thanks for letting me know about that. Um, Rift well, updates. Last story is just about the user-created spaces in Rift. Yeah, so uh, do you ever go to home? No. You have to sometimes. Like yeah. you put the Rift on and suddenly it's it's been loading for a minute or two. Well, yeah. Why is it taking up all my resources? Ah, it loaded my home. Yeah. Thank you, Rift. Which you actually put in some time and effort into your home you recently. Visit, you came home I didn't my... visit. You told me about it. Oh. Um, you know, I did. I went through a couple days where I was like, fine, let's, let's do this. Let's see what this is all about. And I decorated my space. I'm happy with it. I've done a better job than in you or Norm. Mm-hmm. So I, I've accomplished what I set out to do. Now, you don't just have to deal, you don't just have to place objects that you are given or choose. Um, I don't, can you choose? You can choose out exterior environments prior to this, but I don't think you could choose more than one interior environment. Now they're giving you a few new interior environments to choose from. And they're saying they have rolled out the ability to Im- import your own models. So if you'd like to, should I do this? Is it worth doing? Do I you enjoy your home. This is a weird thing. Like I, I'm, I'm, I think it's a worthy experiment. I don't think that it should be something that you're forced into. You should just no, should not always forced. choose to go there. The idea of it being multi-user is very interesting because that's right up there in the Ready Player One, you know, mm-hmm. imagination. And the fact that you can now do user generated content, I think it's all heading in the right direction. I don't I just don't think they should force you into it. We gotta make the tested office as one of as Norm's home. It's a great idea. Or Adam's cave. Yeah. I think, oh well that would be amazing. That yeah. would actually be like something super cool. Yeah. But that's like a project. He has a, a few things in that cave. It would take a little while to recreate. <laughs> yes. No, absolutely. But I, I like I, but what I see is something more like rec room like i think Mm -hmm. oculus needs a better hub that is social and multiplayer that isn't something that you're just like relegated to that is your your space i totally hear you like i i get that um it's more like the how much time do i want to invest in yeah in actually customizing the space do you like and just really seeing if it was enjoyable or not well rec room's shown a lot of success with that they have have a lot of maker tools that you can design with and they're actually, in some ways, very r- limited. But that doesn't stop people from trying and reproducing. In fact, having Mario it, Kart, having it be limited is actually a, a benefit. I feel like to yeah. the ecosystem. Well, that's about going to do it for us this week. We did it on friend. the Duo Cast, the greatest podcast of all time. I think so. Yeah, I mean, at least in terms of podcasts I've done today, this is the greatest <laughs> one. Ah. But it's still early. Um, thank you for joining us, uh, Jeremy. Where are you going to be next week? Are you going to be roaming the the floors of the of the uh, of GDC? 
It's, no, it's not next week. Two weeks? We got a couple weeks before that. Couple yeah. weeks. That's well, what I meant. We, we, I am going to GDC, um, and we will be reporting on all things Oculus. Um, I know it was leaked that Oculus is doing an event um, prior to GDC, and I'll we'll be attending that. And oh. I'm excited about all things VR at GDC. Can't wait. So if you see Jeremy, say hello. Yes, I love saying hello. Mm-hmm. And um, uh, next week is my birthday. <gasps> So are we going to have a podcast on your birthday? It, it is podcast day. So I don't know if I'm going to be busy that day or not. You um, should be. Yeah. We'll I hope s- you we'll are. See. hope we'll for see. your benefit, you're busy. Thanks. Norm will be back next week. Yep. I think there's a lot of cool stuff on the, uh, on the site right now. Um, there's m- more of the um, of Adam's build with uh, Terry English that's up on the site and a ton of other content, too. That's nice of you to think about promoting Tested's content. I am a member. <laughs> you are a team member. No, no, I'm actually a member of the site. Oh, I've been oh, a member oh, oh. of the site for a long time. I thought that was a no, there's no I in team kind of thing. All right. No, that's not true. There is an I in, in Kishore. Uh, that'll do it for us. Uh, see you next week. Do we have an outro? We do. Uh, these were these come v- uh, via email. Oh. So, uh, which actually the, the proper way to submit outros is to the um, the forum the, on tested.com. If you just Google tested outro, you'll find a very long thread posted in there. Um, that, But uh, I was forwarded these and we will try one. Uh, here we are. And I will first unmute and then hit the play button. Hi there, I didn't see you. Test it. Daddy, oh. tell us another one. <laughs> tell, tell us the story of first contact. Daddy. Test it. Hey, so I did my uh, Alamo Draft House movie night last night. What movie was it? Uh, Gravity. Oh, yeah. Beautiful on mute. I love that movie on mute. Um, and they showed a preview for an Apollo 11 documentary in 70 millimeter. Just stunning. We have to all go see it. What do you mean they showed a preview? They Like a preview before the movie? You yeah, know, like movie yeah. previews? <laughs> they yeah. showed a preview for a movie coming out. I never heard it because it's the 50th anniversary this year. They're releasing all this documentary footage in 70 mil. Really? It was stunning. It was, it was at, it like blew my mind. Wow. I like walked up on stage. I didn't know what to say after, because that was the last preview. I want to, it's just called Apollo 11 too. Got to go see it. I would like to see that movie. Yeah. See you next week. Bye.